Hello beautiful bookworms, welcome to Squirrel's Bookshelf, I'm Jess, head squirrel, and a big thank you to everyone who watched my last video and voted on which bookish book I should read next. There was a bit of a tie between a few books, so I went with Misery by Stephen King. I'm about 75 pages into it so far, and um, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> But that's kind of what I expected with Stephen King. In the meantime, I have just received the newest Pages & Co book. If you watched my last video, you will know I love this series, and this is the brand new book that just came out. I pre-ordered it from Waterstones, and um, I actually got a signed copy. So fancy. So I'm definitely going to be reading this once I finish Misery. Actually, I might start reading this if I feel I need a break from this one. It might be my, my balancing book. So I know I just did a library update video, but I've changed things already. I found that the placement of my desk was a little bit problematic for a number of reasons. I sort of was just constantly dazzled by the light coming out of the window because it is quite a dark room otherwise. Also, there are zero power outlets on this side of the room. So let me show you what I've done. So that space back there is where I did have my desk. In my last video, you will have seen all of those piles of books that I am currently working on inputting into my bookshop's inventory. Those have all now moved under the window for the time being, but once they are cleared, I do hope to put a nice cozy reading chair back in that space, as well as move my little rotating bookshelf with my bookish books into that space, which means I have moved my desk back to where my original workspace was. So this is going to be my permanent workspace once again. And this weekend I'm gonna try to get a nice shelf that I can install on the wall over there so I have the majority of it to use aside from my book press. But that's gonna be this weekend's mission. That's enough of that, let's get into the heart of this video. So it's a new room and a new day, because as I was filming yesterday, my audio stopped recording, which is thoroughly on brand because today I'm going to talk about being overwhelmed. I have been feeling a bit overwhelmed lately. It is a fairly regular thing for me now. Essentially, my to-do list is perpetually, unattainably long, and I get really hard on myself, even though I'm well aware that I want to do far more than time allows. So today I wanted to share with you five things that I've started doing recently that have at least helped with this feeling of being overwhelmed, feeling like you're always running out of time. Essentially tips to improve productivity and mental health. Now these are just things that have worked for me, I'm well aware they might not work for anybody else, but just in case anyone out there is feeling a bit like me, I'm hoping, well, maybe these things will help you too. Number one, let's talk about reading. Despite being the focus of my channel, I do not read nearly as much as I would like to, and probably less than you think I do. And it just comes down to time. I feel like I never have time to actually just sit down and read for a while. I do find that audiobooks help a lot. I was a little bit adverse to audiobooks until the last couple of years when my sister got me into them. But you know what? As adults with lives and families and work, sometimes that is just the best way. So I like to listen to audiobooks when I'm doing things like driving or cooking or cleaning. I even sometimes listen to it at work if I'm doing a task where I don't need to be focusing too hard. But at the same time, I do miss sitting down with a physical book. So what I've been doing recently is finding time where I usually grab my phone and instead replacing that phone time with book time. And I've found two main instances where this has been a really good substitute. One of them is right before bed. It is not healthy for us to be staring at screens right before bed anyway. So what I've been doing is instead of charging my phone right next to my bed, I have moved my charger to the opposite side of my bedroom. And frankly, it helps me get up in the morning because now my alarm is across the room. And in its place, I keep a short stack of books that I'm currently reading so I can just grab one before I go to sleep. Now, sometimes I don't get very much read before I fall asleep, but at the very least, it helps me from being in a reading slump. 
The other place I have replaced phone time is in the bathroom. I habitually grab my phone when I have to go to the bathroom, particularly if I'm going to be there for a little while, but I don't need to. So instead I'm keeping a book nearby so I can grab that instead. So those have been the ways I've been getting a little bit more reading in lately. Number two, writing. Now, I have wanted to be a writer since I was about seven. However, almost all of my writing has been strictly confined to my laptop where nobody sees it because I have trouble finishing things. I am a total perfectionist and it has held me back. But I just recently listened to an interview with Neil Gaiman and one of the things he talked about in this interview, which I will link down below in case anyone else is interested, is that he prefers writing his first drafts with a fountain pen in a notebook. And the reason for this is it inspires a completely different style of writing than if you're typing. You really stop and think a little bit more about each sentence before you put it down on paper, and it also helps just propel you through the story rather than being in this mindset of trying to revise it as you go. That's exactly my problem. I generally type all of my stories, and that's because I happen to be a very fast typer and my brain is just intuitively tuned to efficiency, possibly as a result of growing up in the US. But I felt like giving this method a try. And so for a brief moment, I thought, well, I need to order this notebook that Neil Gaiman recommends, and I need to refill my fountain pen, and then I can give it a shot. Don't get caught in that trap. Oh, I just need the right tools to be able to do this. So despite not having the exact tools that Neil Gaiman recommended, I thought I could still make this work by writing with a quill and ink. This was a gift from my sister. I had taken it out of the box and very neatly laid it on my desk as a decoration, but I had never actually used it. So I grabbed myself some A4 paper. This is actually paper that wasn't usable in the printer because it's too thin and we didn't know what to do with. And I took my quill and my ink and I just started writing. And oh my gosh, I get it. Because when I was typing, Every time I'd go to sit at my laptop, my brain immediately wanted to reread everything I had written to that point, editing as I went, so I never progressed with the story. And because I kept spending so long on these earlier parts of the story, I kind of got bored with it. And that's why I have so many unfinished novels on my laptop. Well, hi there, it's Editing Jess. So I just now edited some of the writing portion of this video, and I took a break to go to the loo, grabbed Misery, and read this. There was no delivery date to think about, yet there was always a deadline. Deadline, a time after which you had to leave the circle, and most writers knew it. If a book remained roadblocked long enough, it began to decay, to fall apart. All the little tricks and illusions started to show. Stephen King gets it. I also wanted to quickly point out that earlier in this video, I was at page 75 in Misery, and I'm now currently at page 144, and that is only through reading in bed and reading on the loop. Just that extra bit of reading in my day has gotten me another 70 pages forward. Back to your regularly scheduled program. But writing by hand does absolutely change the way you write. Not to mention, there's something oddly satisfying about the occasional ink stains on my fingers. It's a nice visual reminder to me throughout the day of the story that I'm writing and a reminder to keep going. Now, this was not the first piece of advice I got from Neil Gaiman. I actually took his masterclass online last year. My sister had gifted me an annual subscription to Masterclass, and Neil Gaiman's class was definitely one of my favorite classes. However, I also am actively implementing another tip that I got from the Masterclass of R.L. Stein, the author of the Goosebumps and Fear Street novels. I kind of just took his class for fun, but I'm really glad that I did because he gave me a really useful tip that I have found works really well in conjunction with this new style of writing. So R.L. Stein's method of writing is he has a set period of time in the day that is his writing time. And when he gets to the end, he stops, no matter where he is in the story, no matter if it's in the middle of a big scene, in the middle of a chapter, even in the middle of a sentence, he just stops. And that's because if you stop in the middle of something, you're gonna be much more eager to come back and finish what you are writing, which is definitely true for me as well. Now, I do usually finish my sentence, although not always. There have been a couple of times when my timer has gone off and I happen to be in the middle of thinking about how to finish the sentence anyway, but usually, regardless of whether I'm timing myself or not, I intentionally stop in the middle of something. If I've reached a nice, comfortable stopping moment, if I've reached the end of a chapter, I keep going and write at least a sentence or two just to get the ball rolling again. So using these different methods, as well as some scheduling tricks, which I'm about to talk about, I have been writing every single day. 
since I started this. I am currently seven chapters in and it has made writing so much fun and so rewarding and I feel like I'm getting somewhere. Now the next thing I want to talk about is something that I sort of hate myself for talking about but it does need to be talked about and that is exercise. I am the type of person who honestly loathes the idea of having to exercise. I just don't like it. And it's not about laziness. There are activities I actually love doing like dancing, which are exercise. But for me, I have so many interests and so many things that I both need and want to do in my day. I've always had trouble making exercise a priority in my life, but I am getting older and I am unfortunately starting to feel it. Uh, it sucks feeling like that. <laughs> so I made the decision that I was going to do something about it. But here's the thing. I had a pretty big revelation recently. I think I've always thought about exercise the wrong way. And it's not surprising when you think about how our culture has evolved, but exercise to me had always been something that you needed to do for your physical health, which it does, let's be real. But if you are somebody who is adverse to it, if you're somebody who grew up hating PE, then it just becomes nagging at some point, doesn't it? Yes, I know, I have to do this. But what I've realized recently, which now seems absurdly obvious, is that if I feel ill, I take medicine. And exercise is medicine for your mental health. And that change of mindset has been everything for me. The physical benefits are great and they're necessary, but for me, they're a byproduct of something I do for my mental health. The world is crazy right now and it's stressful and it's anxious and even in the fairly comfortable and privileged position I am, I feel way more stressed out and overwhelmed than I ever used to. And even though I still hate exercising, if I'm feeling mentally down, I am using that as a signal to go do a workout. And it doesn't have to be much. I can turn on a YouTube video that's five or ten minutes long where I get to dance around to Disney songs, but it helps. It so helps. Finally, if you're like me, using up valuable time for exercising may seem counterintuitive to your productivity, but in fact, I find that if I'm in a better frame of mind, I can then accomplish my other tasks much more efficiently. So to really implement these better practices, I am having to intentionally make time for them. My husband and I now have a dedicated day every week where we go cycling. I have also made the commitment to hire a personal trainer, which I'm aware I'm extremely lucky to be able to do, but my trainer is very, very reasonable as far as trainers go. But I have had to shift my finances to prioritize paying for these training sessions to take care of myself and not spending that money on other things I'd probably prefer spending it on. But for me, I felt it was a necessary step. I'm using these training sessions to work on full body strength because frankly, I was completely clueless on how to strengthen my body. So that so far has been tough, but a really worthwhile investment. In addition to all of that, I have also this month signed up for a charity challenge. I am jumping rope every single day, 100 skips a day, to help raise money for Cancer Research UK. And I thought, well, this is a great way to challenge myself and also to raise money for a good cause. If you'd like to follow my glorious skipping habits, I am posting videos of my 100 skips a day on my social media, so you're welcome to follow me on Instagram at squirrelynerdyjess if you fancy. But also, if you would like to donate to Cancer Research UK, I will put a link down below, which takes you to my personal fundraising page. I have set a modest goal of 150 pounds. I am hoping we can exceed that though. For perspective, 50 pounds can buy special restriction enzymes, which help researchers divide DNA and learn more about the 200 plus types of cancer. 100 pounds could pay for a patient's cancer biopsy, and 200 pounds funds 10 cancer nurses for one hour, offering confidential support and guidance to people affected by cancer truly no amount is too small. However, do keep in mind that you don't have to give any money to be able to help out. Sharing my fundraising link or even just sharing or liking this video helps spread the word at no cost to you. I know a lot of people are going through real challenges at the moment, so whatever you are able to do to help is greatly appreciated. 
and you don't have to be in the UK to be able to donate. Frankly though, any developments in cancer research do benefit the entire world. But if you are in the UK, you can also add gift aid to your donation. All right, now bringing all of these things together, my number four is morning and evening routines. Over the last few years, I've sort of gotten out of having any sort of routine to my day. Part of it was moving countries and just experiencing a different kind of lifestyle, but I know that I used to be a person who benefited a lot from certain routines and schedules. And again, this might not be everybody, but it is for me. So I have reestablished some routines first thing in the morning and right before I go to bed. Now my nighttime routine isn't that exciting. It's basically doing my teeth, washing my face, and as I mentioned, reading before I go to bed. Although I also want to mention the fact that I have a daily alarm set on my phone to get ready for bed. It's not a hard stop to my evening, but it keeps me aware of the time and it helps to keep a regular sleep cycle, which is so important for your mental and physical health as well. But my morning routine is the one that I am really feeling very good about lately. I think I've put the most into getting this morning routine right and setting myself up for the day. So I'll briefly run you through my morning routine in case you find anything that might be helpful to your own. I have two alarms set in the morning, one at 8 o'clock and one at 8.20. Now, as I have said, my phone now exists across the room. So when the alarm goes off, I am forced to get out of bed to turn it off. But luckily and annoyingly for me, my dogs also like to jump up with my first alarm and run downstairs to go outside. So either way, I have to get out of bed with my first alarm. So I'll get up to follow the dogs. Now on the way to the staircase, I quickly nip into our bathroom upstairs and take out my mouth guard, which I wear because I grind my teeth at night, unfortunately, and grab my toothbrush. And I like to brush my teeth first thing in the morning to keep them protected for the day. And I do that as I'm going downstairs and letting the dogs outside. The dogs then like to run back in and jump back into bed to snuggle with my husband for a bit. So I will finish brushing my teeth and then I will go and sit down to write. I have added writing into my morning routine now, which is probably the reason I have managed to write every single day. Now I usually only have about 10 to 15 minutes before my second alarm goes off, but Utilizing R.L. Stein's method, that has actually worked wonders because it's almost a given that I'm going to be stopping in the middle of something. And it only makes me that much more excited to come back to write. Now, sometimes I do manage to write a bit in the evenings as well, which is when I have to be a bit more intentional about stopping in the middle. But anyway, once my second alarm goes off, I will then generally start getting ready for my day. Now, right now, because I am doing this October skipping challenge for Cancer Research UK, after I change my clothes, I am going outside and doing my 100 skips. I could do these later in the day, but right now I'm kind of enjoying doing them first thing in the morning. For one, I'm getting some fresh air first thing in the morning, which I find very therapeutic, but also doing a bit of something where I get my heart rate up first thing in the morning sort of helps me wake up in probably a healthier way than coffee. I have actually completely stopped drinking coffee. I did this a while ago after reading Matthew Walker's Why We Sleep, but I was sort of in a fortunate position where I already didn't rely on coffee in the morning. I just sort of drank it as a thing to do. But actually I found getting rid of caffeine made me feel a lot better on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not even sure caffeine really woke me up in the first place, but it definitely made me even sleepier the next day. So instead, I just have water in the morning, and like I said right now, I'm skipping to kind of help wake me up. Now, I can't say what's gonna happen once I get past October, but for the time being, I am considering keeping that as part of my morning routine. I don't know though, we'll find out. After that, I will go make my husband a cup of espresso. He unfortunately is a night person, so getting up in the morning is rather difficult. So he does need that little bit of extra help. But he and I have both actually gotten into the sleep research in the last few years. So even though he does have coffee in the morning, he will not have coffee past midday, past noon. That's kind of getting off topic. So I give him his little cup of espresso and then I'll probably go downstairs and feed the dogs. Breakfast is something I wanted to highlight here because I have always struggled finding the right breakfast. For most of my life, I have had really bad cravings for sweet things, a pastry or a muffin or a pan of chocolate, everything that's just, you know, fabulous for you. So I have been really, really trying over the last few years to find a better breakfast, something that will fill me up so I don't end up trying to snack before lunchtime, and something that frankly has better nutrition. And I have found it. 
So I have found, again, nothing is sponsored here, but it's a cereal. I don't know if you can get it outside the UK, but it's called Fuel and it's kind of a granola muesli mix. It's got dried fruit and pumpkin seeds and it has some protein and lots and lots of vitamins. So that is something I've really been enjoying. And now here comes the weird part. I add grated carrot. This is something I heard of in a YouTube video, so I gave it a try and I am now hooked. <laughs> you sort of don't, I mean, depending on how much you put in it, you don't actually really taste the carrot that much, but you get the nutrients from it and it adds a bit of a crunch. But added to that, I always like to slice up a banana. I'm a big fan of bananas. And then I put some oat milk on top. So the whole thing is also vegan, which is a bonus. Pair that with a nice glass of ice water and I feel so good in the mornings now. And I have not got bored with it yet. I have been doing this for months and months and months now. The same breakfast every day and I love it. It just goes to show that proper nutrition really does make a difference. So those are my routines, which I have found very much helped me recently. But I'm gonna take it one step further and talk about my number five. I have started actually scheduling out my entire day. Now, I'm not doing this every day. I'm generally doing it on days off where I don't have any sort of plans. So days where I know I have the entire day just to get stuff done. Although some elements of this can be useful on a day-to-day -day basis, even on days where I have to go to work. So this is what I do. First thing in the morning, either during or after my morning routine, maybe as I'm eating breakfast, I will sit down and spend about five minutes creating this schedule. Now I start with writing down just a master to-do list. Everything I can think of possibly wanting to get done in the day, whether it be work-related or hobbies or household chores, also fitting in things like reading and exercising, maybe writing, going outside, making sure I have my meals, every little task I can think of, I write it down. And then from that list, I sort of divide them into major tasks and minor tasks. And then from the major tasks, I pick the one thing. What is the one thing that I want to get done for the day, that when I get to the end of the day, I will feel accomplished because that thing is done. And then I compile my schedule for the day. I will pick out the priority items from my major to-do list and actually schedule time blocks all throughout the day, usually no more than an hour or two, and fit each of those in. Making sure I do things for my health as well, scheduling in an exercise break, scheduling in lunch, and then once my schedule is complete, I will turn on alarms for the end of every single time block. Now again, I only included the major tasks within those time blocks, but if I ever finish one of those tasks early, rather than moving to the next thing on the schedule, I will fill that time with something from the minor to-do list. Just a little task that you need to get done, a quick tidy up, sending off a quick email maybe. But I found that makes me feel really good because I end up squeezing in a little bit more into my schedule without having to throw off the whole rhythm of it. And again, this is all just stuff that I find works for me. This is not a directive that you have to follow. But since I go through these patterns of feeling overwhelmed constantly, I find that actually creating a schedule, one, helps me manage my expectations. Two, it helps me make sure I don't get bogged down in one task for too long. It also ensures that if I'm doing a task that I'm sitting down for, or that's in front of a screen or something that I really should be taking breaks from, that I am actually getting up and doing something else. But also you can get to the end of the day and look at what you've done and feel really good about it. You can actually see on paper, you can even check it off as you go throughout the day and say, look what I got done today. Oh, and one thing on the alarm front, make sure you pick a tone that isn't annoying or making you feel like, I don't know, you're in school or something. I pick a really mild alarm. I think it's just called Signal. And it's just a very mild little audible reminder that it's time to move on to the next thing. But the alarm system is really useful because then you don't have to be staring at a clock and you can give yourself that separation from what time is it, how much time do I have left, and really just focus on what it is you need to do. Now, the reason I limit myself to no more than one to two hours per task is also because there's this weird psychological thing that happens when we have to get a certain task done and we have a finite time to do it. If we have an unlimited amount of time to do it, it's very easy to stretch that time out versus if you know you have a deadline, even if you're not watching the clock, but you still know that there is a deadline where you're going to have to stop. That does give this sort of boost of motivation and productivity, frankly. Or conversely, if it's a task you're not really that excited about, you know you only have to be working on it for this amount of time. 
Anything that's like housework or cleaning, I actually like to set no more than 15 minutes for because you would be surprised how much you can get done if you just limit yourself to a very short amount of time. The last point about this whole scheduling thing is thinking about that one thing again. That one thing that you want to get done in the day, I would recommend putting it somewhere in the earlier part of your day. Wow, it got really bright all of a sudden. <laughs> but yeah, take that one thing and put it somewhere near the start of your schedule. That way, it gets out of the way quickly, but also, let's face it, life happens, things come up, and sometimes you don't get the task done that you have scheduled for yourself. What I do when that sort of thing happens is I keep the time blocks as they are, I keep my alarm set, and I just reshuffle which task I've decided to do in each time block. I find the task that I can most easily drop or do another day, and I just replace it. So if you put your one thing early in the day, if something comes up, you then have the rest of the day to be able to reschedule that in case something does come up. That is my five things that I have been doing recently that have really, really been helping my feelings of feeling overwhelmed and feeling like I'm not getting as much done as I want to. But there are so many ways to manage these sorts of things. These are just suggestions that work for me. I'm sure some of you have tips that work for you really well too. And frankly, I'd like to hear them. And I want to be clear, I'm not just talking about things that are quote unquote productive. With all of this scheduling and routine stuff, I'm also thinking about life. I'm thinking about spending time with my husband, spending time with my dogs, seeing friends and family, doing things that are good for your health, taking intentional self-care time. Those things can be scheduled too, and oftentimes they need to be, otherwise we just let them go. That's all I have for you today. Please let me know in the comments if you have any tips yourself. And until next time, be kind, be curious, and be effective. Bye! By the way, I just wanted to show you that filming this video... Oh, and I have two minutes to spare.